live in a massive world that by any stretch just keeps getting bigger. But you know how many people there are in the eyes of God? Whenever pastors ask that question, you know it's a trick question. So you might be asking, well, what trick question is being asked? Should I, you know, he exists outside of time. So everyone that has come before, everyone that will come after, is that how many? What's well, a shockingly few number of people? There's only two. There are two heads of humanity that unite all of us together. One that we are born into and one that by grace we are reborn into. The first Adam and the second. The first man and the firstborn from the dead. Adam himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, the many are collected up into these two covenantal heads, Adam and Christ Jesus. And so today we're going to look at Romans 5, 12 through, 7, or 12 through 21, as we continue in our series through the book of Romans. And we're going to look at what is called covenantal headship, or it's also called federal headship. But don't think the word federal means like the federal government. It just comes from the word foetus in Latin, which we translate as federal, or, or sorry, Latin, which means covenant. So they both just mean covenant headship. Don't go Googling federal headship uh, because, and why I wanted to just make a brief comment on this, it has nothing to do about whether or not women need to wear bonnets at church, okay? So there is a group of people on the internet uh, that would think that. However, that's just a word used in covenant theology, which Anglicans affirm covenant theology. God has given one book for his people. The overarching theme is grace. And what we see all throughout the scriptures is that God deals with his people, the many, through one covenant head. So first, what we're going to do is look at how he interacts with people through these covenantal heads in the Old Testament. The second thing we're going to look at is life under Adam as the definition of original sin. So yes, a light, easy breezy, summertime sermon, original sin this week. But then third, we're going to look at the good news at life under the federal head, Christ Jesus, for it takes us as far as we have gone from God. He brings us even nearer. It is the grand reversal and super abundance of grace. So first, uh, let's open up our scriptures together to Romans 5, 12 through 17. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men and women, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. In our modern age, personhood is fundamentally defined as being a self-generating, self-projecting, authentic self. But your selfhood is found within you. It is something that you create something that is distinct from others. And we, you know, tell our children, you know, be your authentic self, right? And then actually what we're doing is we're giving them a burden no human being was meant to bear because we actually weren't meant to be self-authenticating beings. Rather, what we see in the Holy Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, is that being or selfhood is always understood in relation with others. And so in the Old Testament especially, to be a part of the people of God meant that you had a covenantal head that united you and all the other members of the people of God in this one. 
And God interacts with the many through the one. Now, this might sound familiar to you because I talk about it a decent amount. Those ones are often three offices, the prophet, the priest, and the king. The prophet is the one that God speaks to, and then he comes down and speaks to the many. But he also gathers the words of the many and speaks to God. You see this fundamentally with Moses. Moses talks with God on behalf of the people. And you hope that conversation is going well, right? Because you don't get to be up on Mount Sinai. It's only him. So you're hoping and praying that goes well. Now, this other one that we can understand is the priest, right? The great high priest on the day of atonement goes into the holiest of holies. You know, if you're a woman, you don't get to do that. If you're not a Levite, you don't get to do that. If you're, not a, a, if you're a child, you don't get to do that. If you're anyone but him, you don't get to do that. So everyone is counting on this one person to offer sacrifices properly. Everyone's hopes that they are made right with God are focused on him. And he wears a breastplate with 12 stones on it. And he goes into the holiest of holies to offer sacrifices to God. And you just say, I hope that's going well. Because everything hinges on that. You have with the king right? The king is the one that I think sometimes we mistake. A king is the one who, on behalf of God, governs. God is a just God who has a law, and therefore he entrusts the king to govern justly. But also what we see, and this is almost, I don't it's not explicit. You have to kind of theologize here, but I think it's absolutely accurate. It is also the case that when the king is righteous, in their life, the many are carried into righteousness. And when the king falls into sin, the many are drugged down with him. So you see, whenever the kings fall into sin, what happens? The kingdom becomes divided. Unrighteousness tears apart God's people. So why am I saying all of this? The Israelites knew everything in life hinges upon our covenantal heads and your hope is placed in them. You look to them as your hope. You look to them as your source of being. You look to them. And so the best thing in life is if you have a good covenantal head, and the worst thing in life is if you have an unrighteous covenantal head that leads you into sin and death. And what Paul is doing in our passage today is he is abstracting up another layer. He is pulling back even further, and he is saying, at the end of the day, there are two. There are two covenantal heads that unify the many into one. One leads to sin and death and destruction. His name is Adam. And one leads to righteousness and life. And his name is our Lord Jesus Christ. And everything hinges upon who are you under? Who are you united to? Now, with this in mind, let's turn back to Romans 5, 12 through 14. And maybe you can read it with different eyes. That identity is found in who you are under. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, the one brought it to the many, and death through sin, so death spread to all men and women, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Here we see this foundational reality of what theologians call original sin. The easiest shorthand to understand original sin, being under Adam. That's what it means to be born under the treacherous servant, to be born under the one who was meant to serve God and yet tried to be king himself. To be born under this covenantal head, what we see in our text today, brings forth sin and brings forth death. David knew it. This is why we read Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. When we are born, we are born under Adam. 
and therefore under the curse. But I want to make two caveats before we go any further. Here are the two things uh, I want to say is first, that does not mean that human beings aren't accountable for their sin. When we sin, we sin in, with, and through Adam, but we still sin and we are still held responsible for it. And the second thing I want you to hear, especially those who have been profoundly wronged and those that carry trauma in their life, sometimes what can happen with original sin is we can misappropriate it to say, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, therefore we're all just at the exact same level. And what that does is diminish profound wrongs. And that's also not what original sin says. Original sin does not say that there are not uniquely heinous evils in the world. It does not say we are all as bad as we could be. Think about it like this. It doesn't say that your glass is all poison, but it does say that one drop of poison poisons the whole glass. See, this is what total depravity is. It doesn't mean we are as bad as we could be. It doesn't mean you are morally equivalent to Hitler. But it does mean every part of our being has been touched by fallenness. We have been touched by our head, Adam, and therefore we have fallen with him. We are clothed in the great traitor to the king, the servant who sought to be master, and death has entered the world. It has been said the most objectively verifiable doctrine in Christianity is original sin. So one thing, the rest of the world's like, yeah, it sounds about right. I've also heard it said, if you want evidence of original sin, put one toy in a room with two toddlers and watch the human heart unfold. This is the first point that Paul is making, that we are not born morally neutral, that we are not born good and happen to go bad, but that we are all born with corrupted hearts. And we don't just need a tune-up, we need to be recreated. You know, heresies are always created with good intentions, okay? We always have the luxury of looking back at heretics, and we define them as heretics, right? But normally, heretics are trying to do a good thing. That's why they have an audience, okay? So there's no but, it's very rare that you've got, you know, a nefarious individual. I'm going to corrupt the church. <laughs> it's normally something is really wrong with the church. I care, but I come to a solution the Bible doesn't permit. And there was a fourth century monk named Pelagius who did just this. Pelagius, who was a contemporary of St. Augustine, he saw the ra- rampant sin in the church, especially amongst the clergy, Right? And Pelagius was a very devout monk. You know, as Anglicans, one of our problems is the British Isles have produced as many great heretics as great theologians. There's a problem there. You know, that's neither here nor there. But he was from England. Well, what is now called England. It was Rome at the time. Um, But he saw issues, lots of issues in the church. And he also heard this idea of original sin. We're all evil. We're born into evil. And he thought, hey, this is the problem. We need to tell people to try harder. We need to tell people to take holiness seriously. And all of this talk about original sin is just letting people off the hook. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. So, you know, if I'm a monk and I have a wife stowed away over here, no big deal, right? And Pelagius led a reform that was well-intended. We must take holiness seriously, but the solution is not permitted. And what happens is that the medicine is worse than the disease. Because what happens in Pelagianism? He said, we are all born morally neutral. We're all born, you know, able to do good, able to do bad. But we aren't born with turned in hearts against God. If we say that, then it's just going to let everybody off the hook. And so Pelagius' understanding of the Christian life can be summarized in do better, try harder, obey God. He gave you a will, so use it. You weren't born fallen. You weren't. You were born good, or at least not bad. 
so old day. And even in our world today, that sounds like a kinder word than the word of the Bible. You were born under Adam. You were born with a turned in heart. It sounds like a nicer word. But what is the consequence of that medicine? It leads people into radical despair and self-loathing because everyone knows in their heart of hearts, I try and I don't get better. I try and I can't seem to obey. I try and sin is still lurking in my heart. It's like telling a group of people in a puddle of mud, use that water to wipe yourself off and be clean. All it does is spread it around. And so as often is the case, have you ever noticed that Superman is not a very good superhero? That's my opinion. I'm not a Superman fan. And I think it's because he has too many powers. He's too powerful. But it's also because his villains aren't very good. His villains aren't very good. Lex Luthor is just a ball guy. Like, oh, well. But Batman, on the other hand, is incredible. Why? Because Batman has the best villains. He does. Scarecrow's really scary. So is Joker. They're all really scary. A good hero needs great villains. And the greatest hero in the history of the church needed a really good villain. And his name was St. Augustine. Because Pelagius woke up from slumber, this resting giant named St. Augustine. And so much of our theology on the human will, on salvation, on what it means to be reconciled to God came out of the debate between Augustine and Pelagius. Because Augustine in his own life knew what Pelagius was saying was objectively false. Because if you know his life story, he was a radical hedonist. And his mother prayed for him tirelessly until God rescued him out of his sin. St. Augustine, who was committed to the Holy Scripture, saw himself in Psalm 51, I was born in sin. But the other passage that destroys Pelagianism, and Augustine would come back to time and time again, is Romans 7. 15 through 19, the passage we're going to get to in a few weeks, a passage that does not reveal we are born morally neutral, but actually shows us who we are. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in with, with dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That does not sound like a neutral will. Rather, it sounds like a will born under Adam, born into sin and needing deliverance. Because here's what Pelagianism does. It starts out sounding nicer. You aren't born bad, but then everything's on you to make yourself right. And what there are three results that happen when this is what we teach, because a lot of Protestant churches teach this unintentionally, family, a lot. It's a very human thing to do. Try harder, do better. But what ends up happening is I think three things. One. We try harder and we don't succeed and we end up hating ourselves. The second thing that happens is we try harder and don't succeed, so we hide from one another. The sin that you can't see, you don't want anyone else to see either. Fundamentalist churches, everyone thinks everybody's right and perfect and good because everybody's lying, right? And maybe we have a bit of that here too. And then the final thing, and I think this is the, one that we often do not see and is the most destructive because we can't bear to look at ourselves. We fixate on the wrongs of others because I can't look at how I have failed. I fixate on how everyone else has. There was research done on uh, how different people preach the parable of the prodigal son. And it compared uh, two groups of people, Protestant fundamentalists and mainline Protestant liberals. 
don't think politically liberal. They often are politically liberal, but it's a, it's a theological movement um, in the mainline church. Okay. And it was interesting. Both ways in which they preached the parable of the prodigal son fixated on the other. Fundamentalists said, look at how the younger son ran away. Don't be like him. And aren't we glad we're not like him? We aren't the kind of people that run away from God. That kid, he had it coming to him, right? You know, pig trough and and corn husks. He had it coming. Don't be like him. And aren't we glad we aren't? Mainline Protestant liberal. Aren't we so good that we aren't like the older brother? We are a welcome and inclusive church. And we have to be increasingly welcome and inclusive so that we don't act like that horrible older brother over there. See, when we collapse ourselves into Pelagianism, one Christianity becomes fundamentally purely ethics. But two, what we end up doing, and even this illustration runs the risk of doing precisely that, we can fixate on others in order to not have to examine ourselves. Just like in our church, we could fixate on, well, at least we're not fundamentalists, and we're, at least we're not mainline Protestant, but are we actually analyzing how we are obeying God and following him? You see, Pelagianism sounds like a gift. You are born morally neutral, but what it actually does is keeps a burden onto the shoulders of God's people that they have never been meant to bear. But when we actually have a word of original sin, it's the only posture Christians can take to put our arms around fellow sinners and to ask, are you worn out? Have you been trying to fix yourself and it seems like things just keep getting worse? Do you feel that even in your best moments, you spiral into sin? You are not uniquely broken. You are not uniquely broken. We are all arrive in this world corrupted. We all arrive in this world spiritually disabled. But there is one. There is one who can be strong for you. There is one who can make the lame walk. There is one who gives sight to the blind. There is one who gives hearing to the deaf. And there is one who gives life to the dead because there is another covenantal head, the second Adam, who takes all of the damage the first Adam has done and carries us even closer to God. Turn back with me to Romans 5, 12 through 21 now. Looking at this, here's what I want you to look at. Paul is drawing a comparison. And he's saying, for how far Adam has taken us, Christ Jesus has taken us even closer. Adam has given you a $5 debt, and it's not like Christ gives you a $5 bill to bring you back to, you know, break even. He's given you a $5 debt, and Christ Jesus has given you the family fortune. For how far you have gone, Christ Jesus has brought you back even closer. Now let's look at this together. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sitting was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. 
Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign. Oh, sorry. Now, uh, grace abounded all the more. Grace abounded all the more. What Paul is saying here is this second federal head, he gives you even more than the first federal head took away. For how far you have run, your Savior has run further and brought you even closer. You know, last week, um, I noticed with my, old, my eldest son, Miles, that he was pulling back. He was collapsing into his own head. And I do that when something's wrong, if you know me well at all. And it's, it's not like him. It was a new phenomenon. And I kept saying, Laura, I'm really worried about Miles this week. I need to take him on a bike ride. And so I took him on a bike ride just so I could get some time with him. Because I knew that there could come a time that if he starts pulling back and I don't go to him, he could just keep going and going and going. We know that when our children pull away from us, what do they need? They need to be brought even closer. They don't need to be said, yeah, you just need your space. Keep running. What they need from you and what they need from me is to be brought even nearer into the Father's love, into their mother's love, to be assured of their identity. And what we see in the second covenantal head is for how far you ran from God, he drew you even closer. How far you plunged into sin, he raised you even further into life, into the very throne room of God. How sick you feel in your sin. He has given you even greater healing and life. Brothers and sisters, we have a new covenantal head. We have a new source of our identity. We are no longer defined by being under Adam. Yes, sin lingers, but that is not fundamentally who you are anymore. Rather, who you are is everything that Christ is because he is that for you. He clothes you in his righteousness. He unites you to his very love that he has for the Father. And he brings you into the very life of the Trinity. That is now who you are in him. Brothers and sisters, would we look honestly at the reality of life under our first head, Adam? Showing empathy to those that are suffering under that head, just as we were when we were under him. And would we in our life, on our own lives and in our proclamation in the world point to the life that can be had in Christ Jesus, our new federal head, the one who brings about redemption, life, and reconciliation. Do you remember how I said that the Israelites had to look to their covenantal head for their hope? They knew I can't worship. I can't go into the Holy of Holies. I got to look to him to do it. They knew that they couldn't govern the kingdom. They aren't king. They have to look to him to do it. They knew that they aren't the one that got to go up on top Mount Sinai and hear God's voice directly. They looked to the one who did it. And again and again in the Christian life, what are we called to do? To look to commune with and love the great head who does it all for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you did not leave us in our sins. You did not leave us in our suffering, but you came forth to bring us life, that you tracked us down and brought us home. Father, that for how far we ran from you, you drew us even closer in. Lord, would we rest in that truth all of our days to the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.